have your Bibles with you this morning, I want you to join me in Philippians 2. <clears throat> As we continue our series, Enjoy No Matter What. This morning, the title is a uh, play on words. Okay? So the play on words is following in the footsteps of Jesus. And here's the reality of that statement. We are expected and intended as believers in Christ to follow in His footsteps. But, what does that mean? There's a lot of ideals out there of the significance of that and what it means. So let's read here, Philippians 2, 1-11. through And then I'll hopefully clarify for you biblically and what God's expectations are rather than what some explanations you've heard before. So... Read with me here in Philippians. Some, some very incredible truths here. And, and Harold, y'all did a phenomenal job this morning. Phenomenal job. Every song right here in Philippians 2. And if you can't get excited about that, nothing I can do for you, okay? <clears throat> Philippians 2. Listen to what, what Paul says. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, see, the if... It's a rhetorical statement. Absolutely, where in the world the source of encouragement is Christ. Any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affliction and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. And that's important. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ, who through, though he was in the form of God. Does anybody have a hundred dollar bill this morning? Well, that was worth a shot. Anybody got a dollar? Anybody got a dollar for real? I got four kids. I'm broke as a convict, okay? Bring me a dollar. <clears throat> sure ain't nobody got a hundred dollars? I'm... Thank you. Go sit down. <clears throat> All right. Now, I want you to go back with me, and I want you to concentrate on something. I need you to understand this. He says here in verse 5, Have this mind among yourselves, which is in Christ. Look up here. You and I are to have the same mind that is in Christ. See, we're not we're talking about religion here. We're talking about supernatural transformation. Amen. How would we know? Now, follow with me. Who, though he was in the form of God, that is a coined phrase that did not exist in language until Paul created it to explain the concept of Christ, God the Son, becoming God the Man. Let me explain it to you this way. Pastor, how in the world can we have the mind of Christ? Who's on here? How would you know? You would not know. You wouldn't know what he looked like without a... You would not know what the mind of God is, Christ is, unless and except that he came. And he lived among us. That is how we know. Y'all tracking with me? You see, this isn't some mystical... These are the promises of God right here available to us that you can't have. And we know God's nature and His, His desire. We know all what His mind is. How do we know? Christ. You see, how do we know? I may or may not give that to you later. We may, how do we know? Because God came and showed us Revealed to us through Christ who He was and who He is. It doesn't matter what the preacher says on, on television or the radio or up the street or here. What matters is 
what God revealed. That's what matters. Now, stay with me. Let's read through this, okay? Did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. We're going to dig into what that means and it's going to blow your mind. Okay? So let me go back to verse 5. Have this mind among us, ourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, he was God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant, doulos, slave in the Greek, being born in the likeness of men, See, I told you this morning, didn't I? He understands exactly what you're going through. Therefore, can sympathize. And being found in human form, He, God the Son, humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even death on, notice, not the cross, a cross, the definite article, a cross. It's referring to the type of death that he had to die. Therefore God has highly exalted him be, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. <laughs> it means in heaven, earth, and hell. All will call him Lord. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, capital L, Yahweh. To the glory of God the Father. Listen to me. This is important. This message, it should be incredibly encouraging to you. But do you remember, we're going to build on what we started last week. And I told you, you know, who is in charge and responsible for your happiness? Well, you are. Nobody else. Listen to me very closely. What we're going to learn today is how much God loves us to empty Himself and come to this sin-sick cesspool of a world and endure all that He did to free you and I from sin. But now, how are we going to learn about the love of God? How are we going to get to know that? There are so many Sundays when God gives me an encouraging word for you and some of you walk out of here discouraged or feeling guilty. And do you know why that is? You see, you will always get joy from the word of God except when you allow things to get in front and obscure your view of Christ. We call that sin. And some messages are trying to help us move the things that block our sight. That shouldn't make you feel guilty or make you feel discouraged. It ought to make you feel just like you sang a few months ago because sin always, always, it's what brings storms. It's what brings all the things that try to destroy us. And it's what keeps, tries to keep our eyes off Christ. And you see, sometimes the most encouraging messages and, and the best thing is teaching us how to move those things that obscure our view of Christ. And that's what this is this morning. So when we talk about following in the footsteps of Jesus, it, it won't do you a hill of beans to go to Israel and walk the Via Della Rosa. I've done it. Woo! We're not talking about that. We're talking about getting to know the nature of God more and more and more and more. And today, as we look at who He is, if you don't walk out of here feeling loved, that God would sacrifice everything for your freedom, then you've chosen something else over Him. It's obscuring your view. So, <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to give you a couple of examples of what happens when we allow things to obscure our view of just how much God loves us give you two examples, okay? Here's one. Let me tell you a story. There was this church in Dallas, and they became divided 
They allow things to obscure their view. And, and the rift was so bitter that each one sided and decided to, to bring a lawsuit on the other. And what they wanted to do was this group wanted to take possession of the property and this group wanted to take possession of the property and they couldn't come and it was over a dispute. So they sued one another. Two groups in the church formed sued one another. And so despite the Bible's warning about believers taking one another to court, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 8, the story hits the Dallas newspaper and caught everyone's attention. Why? Because here's the people of God who claim to love one another and love the community and the, the body is trying to rip itself apart. And so what sells drama? So it's on the front of the Dallas newspaper. So the judge was wise enough that he ruled it wasn't in the providence of the court. He said, you guys need to go home, talk to Jesus, and work this out. Pretty wise judge, wasn't it? And so the case had to be handed back to the church's denomination. Eventually, one side won and one side lost. So the, the losers withdrew and they formed another church up the street. That's the vast majority of church planning in America. That's not God's design. That's not how we're supposed to launch churches. Now, follow with me. The, the newspaper traces the source of all these woes, this split, this conflict. You know what they trace it to? And one of the Wednesday night suppers, one of the, one of the deacons, got a smaller slice of ham than one of the kids in front of him in line. Imagine the laugh that the people in Dallas got in the newspapers as this unfolded week after week. You know the sad part about that story? It ain't made up, it's true. Over getting a smaller slice of ham than the child in front of him in line. I'll tell you another one. Another paper recorded a church and they're looking for a new pastor. And so they do kind of what uh, I've seen other churches do before. They bring in a couple of guys to interview him, but somebody comes up with a smart idea and I'm going to read you the, I'm going to read you newspaper clippings on this. These are real instances. They're not made up. They're not just for joke funny purposes. So they get the ideal. We'll just have dueling preachers and see who's the best. True story. I promise. I'm sad to say. So here's the story. Yesterday, the toe, the paper, opposition groups, both sent ministers to the pulpit. Both spoke simultaneously. Each trying to, to shout above the other. Both called for songs in the congregation. They sang too. Each siding with the one they wanted, down to the other. Then the groups began shouting at each other. Bibles were raised in anger. Through it all, the two preachers continued to shout each other, trying to out-preach one another, and they're shouting through their sermons. Eventually, a deacon called a policeman. <laughs> two of them came in and began shouting for the congregation to be quiet, two police officers. They advised the 40 persons in the church to return home. The rivals filed out, still arguing all the way. Last night, one of the groups called a let's be friends meeting, and it broke up in an argument. <laughs> Sad truth. They're both true. But what's the point to that, Pastor? When our eyes are focused on other things, it's impossible to see the love of God. And it's impossible to have the mind of Christ. See, what, what, what I need you to understand is it is a choice that we all have to make. And there's only one source of joy. I want you to look at verses 1 through 4. In the Greek, they're one sentence. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, 
any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affliction and sympathy. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more important, more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. See, in the Greek, there is no break. There is no four separate sentences. It's one sentence. It's one thought. Proverbs 6 says it this way. A worthless person, a wicked man, goes about with crooked speech, winks with his eyes, signals with his feet, points with his fingers, with perverted heart, devises evil, continually sowing discord. Therefore, calamity will come upon him suddenly. In a moment, he will be broken beyond healing. To walk with Jesus and experience joy and to experience the love that God has for us, there's some things we have to consciously, constantly do. And I'm going to tell you something. In any relationship you have, whether it's church, whether it's your significant other, your spouse, whether it's your children. You know what's destroyed our children? You know why our kids are killing one another in schools with guns? It's not video games. It's narcissistic parents that have to draw all their emotional love from a child when it's your job to train the child. And that destroys the psyche of children. You see, here's what I need you to understand. For us to experience all that God has for us, there are certain things we have to consciously be aware of and continuously doing intentionally. And if we will do these things, this outside broken world will beat the door down to come experience the love we have. And what I'm telling you is, if we will do these things, there is nothing that will come upon your life that God will not use us to help see you through. But we individually have to consciously do these things. The first one is this. Listen to this. Unity requires squelching one's own interest. <clears throat> squelching... What does that mean? Well, years ago, long, long ago, in a, in a distant land far, far away, before cell phones, CBs, and the, and the younger folks, huh, what? It was before you had GPS, and when you went and took a long trip, you didn't know what was happening. You couldn't Google it. We all put CBs in our vehicles, right? And so, with a CB in your vehicle, if you squelched or bled over someone, you did what? You cut out everybody. You didn't hear what was being said. We have to squelch, put down, blot out our own personal preferences in order to see the plan and the love of God. And it's something we have to continuously do because our human nature my human nature only cares about me and mine. But I can't, if I have the mind of Christ, I can squelch my evil human nature. And it's something we have to constantly do. You see, what does that look like, preacher? Don't you listen to me very closely? A very wise pastor taught me when I first went into ministry. I said, what is the most important thing I need to know to honor God and take care of the people that God has entrusted me with? And I'll never forget what he said. At first when he said it, it put a bad taste in my mouth. And I went home. And I disagreed with it. And after about seven or eight years of ministry, I thought, holy cow, that's the smartest thing I ever heard. He said, compromise every chance you get. Compromise on everything you can. And I thought, well, that stinking liberal, he ain't worth his salt. But he followed up with this. Because there will be so much that is absolutely non-negotiable. 
that if you do not compromise on what you can compromise on, you will be so callous, stoic, and unloving that you will not be a very good shepherd. Anything I can do besides kick it? Oh. Oh, it's not me. So I need you to listen to me for a second. Listen. The problem we have is we put things in the wrong categories. We put the non-negotiable, uncompromisable things over here. That's, that's the personal interest. Our, this is what's best for me. Rather than over here, the Word of God, the plans of God, the truth of God, the law of God, I can't compromise on that for you, nor me or mine. But we have to learn the difference. So every opportunity that we can compromise, we can compromise because there are just some things that's non-negotiable. And they'll take care of themselves. You don't have to go around with a list or try to, try to they're already decided, God's already decided what we can't compromise. But for the rest, see, the problem arises when we're not willing to do so. So, he, Paul is talking about what is our motivation. And he says, if there's anything, any value to your conversion, Paul says, do this. Paul's appealing to them emotionally. Do you, do you remember when Jesus came into your heart? Do you? Let me tell you something. Your experience doesn't have to be like mine, but let me tell you about mine. I do. As the old folk used to say, there was a burden that rolled off of me that I could never, ever forget. Now, I'm not saying yours has to be that way. I'm just telling you mine. But you do. You should be able to remember. Do you? Do you remember the forgiveness you felt? I've never experienced anything any greater in my whole life. And I've experienced some really great things in life. I have a wonderful wife and a wonderful family who adds incredible joy to my life. Grace adds incredible joy to my life, but nothing compares to experiencing the forgiveness of God. You see, the positive thing that Paul is appealing to them is this. If you remember those things, it ought to allow us to overlook some things with some other folk. It? it ought to motivate us change our perspective, try to, try to remember and, and use God's perspective because God looked at us the way we're looking at whoever we're not, not, not sharing the love of God with or doesn't agree with us. We're not looking at them from God's perspective. We're only looking at them from our perspective. But if we'll look at them through the eyes of Christ, it will afford them a little more latitude. Paul said that in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9. He said we're to be tolerant of others. See, there are just some things, sins, that it's not up for negotiation. We can't be tolerant of those sins. But we can love those people. You don't have to like everything I like. You don't have to agree with me. Hey, in, in whatever meeting we're in, we don't have to see eye to eye on everything, but we do. And we must love one another. Listen to what Paul said. 1 Corinthians 9. He said, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. He says, To the Jew I became a Jew in order to win Jews, and to those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, do you notice anything that resembles even remotely what Paul's doing and what he wrote about what Christ did in Philippians 2? 
God did not have to give up his rights as God to come and live as a man. He didn't have to. But he did. Paul said, I didn't have to give up my rights in Christ. But I went back into the Jewish system because my brothers needed me to. When you look to your left or your right, you don't have to be right all the time. You don't have to get your way all the time. But you do have to love them. He says, to those outside the law, I became as one under the law. Not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. You see, you'll be incredibly encouraged today and you'll walk out with more blessings than when you came in if you allow God to, if you move all these things out of your way. Your relationships will be a whole lot better when you practice these principles. Life. There's so much of it that we just do not have control over. But life does not have control over our joy. Only you do. That's what Paul's saying. Paul says, I've had to put up with a lot. He said, I've had to do a lot. I've had to endure a lot. Why? 1 Corinthians 9, 23. Now, Paul puts it in the positive. Jesus puts it in the negative. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come. But woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. What does that mean, preacher? Matthew 18, 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he listens to you, you've gained a brother. Jesus went on. He said, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. As many as seven times. Jesus said, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servant. What is Paul and Jesus trying to help us to understand? People are just messy. Y'all are messy. But if you love Jesus, you love messes. And you love being part of the mess because when you're in the mess, you get to see what, what only God can do and that's when you've been cleaning up the mess. People are messy. You see, I would almost, I'm not a betting man, but I'd almost bet you a dollar <laughs> that none of you can find me one person that's left any church you've ever been a part of or been mad about something that was any different than other than that person that left just got tired of messing. We have to eliminate, keep our eyes on Christ. Because people are messy. But God loves messes. And when our heart is, is in line with His heart, and our mind is the mind of Christ, it's not the mess that should draw our attention. It is the miracle of the Master that takes the clay and forms an incredible work of art out of the mud in the mire. That's, that's what God's in the business of doing. You see, before you, before you start reading me your list of offenses someone's committed against you, I need you to understand something. You know Jesus has one on you, right? That's all that, that Paul is trying to get us to understand here. That's all that he's wanting us to do. Is to understand 
that we have to stop to, to have the mind of Christ is to look at things through God's perspective. And when we do that, there's a whole lot more room for forgiveness and compassion. You see, you, God's got a list on you, and just like you, you want to be pardoned. And Paul says, hey, we need to be in the pardoning. We need to be in the pardoning uh, business. See, all that's the foundation Paul lays here. He says, if any, and it's a rhetorical question. We're all guilty, but yet we all experience the love of God. We all experience the grace of God and the mercy of God. And if God gave us His mercy and His grace, give me one good reason why there's anybody that you've ever found that doesn't deserve you to return what God's given to you to them. That's what Paul is saying. He says to protect our unity. How do we protect our unity? Be of one mind. Well, I'm American. I get that. We all have different minds. But we're to be doulosses. Slaves. We're to give up our rights like Christ did. That's what creates that, that unity. We're to have one goal. You see, trouble always brews when your goal isn't my goal. <laughs> That's when we have Baptist problems, right? And I've never seen it be anything significant. That's why I said I, I would almost, if I were a betting man, I'd bet you, you can't find me one person that really significantly, it is, it's not impossible, but it's very difficult. Most people get mad and leave churches because their ham wasn't big enough. Just where it's at. What we have to ask ourselves is not, is his goal better than my goal? We have to ask ourselves, what is the goal? That's the question that we have to ask. You see, today there's so much argument over the purpose of a church. There's 101 books out there on the purposes of the church. And, and I can go through all kinds of what our purpose is to be, so on and so forth, and what we're supposed to be doing. But here, here's what the purpose of the church is. Listen, 2 Corinthians 5, 19-21. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against Him, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making His appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. I've got a very important question for you. What is today? Today... Does everyone bring one? Can you dream with me for a second? What if all of us took that seriously? What if every one of us didn't just say, that's a great idea. Seems to work. What if? What if that was the mind we had? That is the overarching motivation of everything we do. What if everyone committed to seriously praying for their one and bringing their one? What if? Let's explore it. 
we'd have one purpose. We'd have one goal. See, if the gospel isn't centered, if gospel, if the gospel isn't the focus, if the gospel isn't the motivation, we have no genuine supernatural meaning. And if the gospel isn't centered, then Doug's ideal has a little merit. Then Ben's ideal, it has merit, though it's different. Then they have, their ideal has merit. But so does mine. If the gospel is not the center motivating thing of everything. The problem is with a lot of good ideals with merit. They become war. They become who is the strongest will. But if we have one central motivation given to us by God. There's supernatural power that keeps these other things in their right places. In their right order underneath the one. The problem occurs when Ben wants his to be number one. Or Sean wants his to be above Ben's and Doug and so on and so forth. See, we have no meaning without witnessing. We. We have no purpose without it. Why else was Paul... Do, do you, have you read, I told you, Acts 16? That gives you the background story of Philippians. Why was Paul in jail? Witnessing. He was in jail for witnessing. Why did Paul get beat up all the time? You, you do know the story of Paul, right? Paul had been beat up so many times so severely that he was, he, he had such scars, he was unrecognizable. He would have friends that wouldn't see him for a couple years on his journeys. He would be unrecognizable to them. The deformities left in his body, his face, from being beat for the gospel. There is no special calling for you to be a witness of God. You all, every one of you are called to be an ambassador. There's no special gifting for it. It's a call. What if we had this one focus? Paul was in prison because he refused to stop witnessing. That's the only reason. There were martyred people in the New Testament. It wasn't because they were fighting over, well, I like this hymn, but I like this on the radio. That's not why there were martyrs in the New Testament. Martyrs. Because they were sharing verbally the gospel to lost people. They had one purpose. One mission. What if we lived out this purpose? You wouldn't care about what you didn't like at church. You really wouldn't. You would significantly not care enough to offend your brother or sister. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty two. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near dead. Five times I received at the hand of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers. Danger from Roger, robbers. Danger from my own people. Danger from the Gentiles. Danger in the city. Danger in the wilderness. Danger at sea. Danger from false brothers. In toil and hardships. Through many a sleepless night in hunger and thirst. Often without food and cold and exposure. And that was their one purpose. That is it. See, it's 
positively as I know how to make it, what Paul was rhetorically doing is what he is so gifted at. He asks in the positive rhetorical question, but he gets right to the heart of the matter. So let me put it on our street level terms and take out the rhetoric in it so that you can understand it. Here's what Paul would say on the street to you. This is the no-nonsense version. He says, if you're not experiencing on some level those things, you've misunderstood your purpose. You don't have to, you, you, you won't have time to complain if you are following the purpose. Friend, I know a lot of people, I, I've watched, I, I kind of have this thing, you know, some people go to the mall, some men, and they're like people watchers. I've become a Baptist watcher, a sheep watcher over the years. And I've served in different levels from bottom to top in the SBC nationally and statewide. And, and I watch Baptists, sheep. I mean, I'm shepherd, sheep, watch sheep. That's kind of what I do. And, and you would be amazed some of the behavior I find in sheep. If it wasn't so heartbreaking, it would be amusing. I have watched sheep stand. And if the shepherd's wife... Not, not my wife, other shepherds in other venues and pastures. I have watched sheep stand in certain spots just to see if the pastor's wife will speak to them. True story, we know it, don't we? Not her. And they do that intentionally. And if she doesn't speak or react or whatever, guess what that sheep does? They bite, they kick, and they stomp, and they... So I don't, I don't understand the purpose. What I need you to understand the purpose is... When we lose our purpose, we resort to all... It, everything robs our joy. And, and before you know it, we're making up ways to give our joy away. See, that's what you're doing. When you're not focused on the purpose, you give your joy away. You see, joy is a gift from God, and nobody can separate you from it. But you can. You can forfeit it. And only you can forfeit it. My wife, no matter how mean she is, she can be mean sometimes. <laughs> nobody can take my joy, not even her. God forbid she walked out on me and left me tomorrow. Not a word. Where's the peanut gun? I know you're thinking it. I know you're thinking But that cannot steal my joy. And my point in that is, everything else we do is just as insane. Childish is the example. The true example I gave you they're all just equally, equally. We don't have to give our joy away. We don't have to allow these things to, to take our joy. Paul says the key is humility. Humility, verse 3. Lowliness. You see, Paul repeats this message in 1 Corinthians 10. 4. He said, let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Here's what I need you to understand. Culture never kills the church. Culture has never even weakened the church. Culture has no power over the church, nor our witness. It is always our own carnal desires that kills the church and our witness. It's the desire to have our own needs met above the desires of Christ. Unity requires dying to our own interests, number two. He said we need this disposition. He, he tells us what disposition we must have. Verse 6 there. Listen to what he says. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. What does that mean? 
Genesis 1.1. Oh, you ought to go read it today when you get home. In the beginning was God. Now listen to Colossians as it explains and, and fleshes this out for us. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things in Him, all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. The form of God. Not the external appearance. But He is the form of God. What, what does that mean? Hebrews 1.3 who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person. What does that mean, preacher? I guess my best hillbilly theological explanation would be when you stare in the mirror, who do you see back? Don't say ugly. Who do you see back? You see, when God stares in the mirror, it's Jesus that we see back. So when it says that He is in the form of God, that's what it means. When God looks in the mirror, it is Jesus that is seen. See, Jesus wasn't created. He was. He always was. He is the second part of the Trinity. And though He is God, and always was God, that's the significance of the word Yahweh, the name Yahweh. Remember I told you in the very chapter, or verse 11, it says, Lord is capitalized. The reason the, the capitalization of the Lord word Lord there, the name Lord, is because the Jews would never write God's personal name as too holy. And so Lord is a substitution for God's personal name, which he didn't have until he gave it to Moses. Moses said, who do I tell them sent me? Up until that point, God was beyond and above even a name. God named Himself so we could relate to Him. And He named Himself Yahweh, which is, I am, I was, and I always will be. That's, that is the God who said all that over here and said, I'm going to go be one of them and experience all they have to go through that I might set them free from it. You know, it's one thing to say you love a person. But it's another thing to put everything, cast it away for their sake. Can I ask you a question this morning? Have you experienced that kind of love ever? Have you ever experienced that kind of love if, if you've not had your life transformed and been set free from your sin and the bondage of sin it's because you've never stopped and opened your hands and received it because when you do it, it will change you you see why do I remember so well when that burden was lifted off of me? Why can I not forget when I was forgiven from my sins? Because that was a work that I could never, ever, ever do. But when God did it, it wasn't, well, I tell you, I, I believe I like that church down the road better than I do great. It wasn't that kind of religion stuff. It was God doing heart surgery. And you see, when, when you have that, then you have something to give those that need it. Would you bow your heads this morning?